which lasted from 1050 to 1010 BC. David's reign would not begin until 1010 BC. But it was known to Saul and his family long before then that they were not the start of a dynasty in Israel. Now, let me get away from that and do my own context here. Last week, lesson, the peoples wanted a king. They said, give us a king. They told Samuel, Jim, we want a king. We want to be like all the other folks. Give us a king. So Samuel said, you know what you want? Talking about? And, and, and Samuel gave them a king. And if you remember last week, we said that when it comes time for Saul to take his place, they couldn't find him. Saul was hid, I said, among the stuff. Saul that went and hid himself. So when they, God told them where Saul was hiding, and they found him, and they came, and they anointed Saul as king. And I said, why was he hiding? We said maybe it was showing his humility and Kate that he, he wasn't used to being in the limelight, and he wasn't, he wasn't used to being before cameras, and, and so he wasn't used to being the central attraction, so he went and hid himself. And I said, well, and it just, maybe he was unsure of himself. And so anyway, it shows the humility of Saul. Now, so they anointed him king. He said, uh, Sister Young, he was tall, and he was good looking. And I said, there we go. all the women said, that's it, that's it. That's the king we want. That's a mighty military leader, that's why. He didn't have on pink. He was a pizza. They're weak. <laughs> That's a king. And so they got them a king like all the other people had. Now, okay. Now I'm going to ask y'all some questions. Get them again, and we're going to get to the lesson. He started out humble. What happened? Because today's lesson, God has rejected Saul. A big, tall, military man, Jeff. He was hiding and all that, and they put him in the limelight. And now, today, he, God has rejected him. In chapter 13, and y'all can fill in the blanks for me, uh, the Philistines had come up to fight, and you know, Saul was waiting on Samuel to come and tell him what to do do the ritual that he go through before they go out to fight. And, and, but, but Saul was, I mean Samuel, didn't get there fast enough for Saul. So what did Saul do? Speak. Oh, Speak. Saul said, okay, Saul. Saul, I'll do it myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can't say that. <laughs> so Saul did the sacrifice himself. That's a problem. <laughs> you know? and, and so when Samuel arrived, this is what Saul said. The Philistine will come down upon me to Gilgag, and I have not made supplication to the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. He said, I, I, he said I, I didn't want to do it, Samuel, but I forced myself and I offered a burnt, a burnt offering. Samuel said, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandments of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. <clears throat> but now, let me find a place. Here. The Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom on, on Israel forever. But now, Thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be captain of all his people, because thou has kept, not kept that which the Lord commanded you. Well, that's one of his mistakes, big mistake. Shouldn't do that. 
Now he started out humble. He's getting a little arrogant now. He just, I'll do what I want to do when I want to do. And I think that sometimes, sometimes we can have some good peoples and we put them in position and it go to their head. Okay? And this is what happened. Saul. I still say Saul started out here. But Jeff is going to his head now. Just like I always say, some policemen, before they get that job, it's good people. When you put a badge on them, and it goes to some of them head. No, I'll leave that alone. <clears throat> Problem number two, chapter 15. God told Samuel, and Samuel told Saul, you know, when we came out of Egypt, the Amalekites messed with us pretty bad. So God told Samuel, tell Saul, I want him to go up, and I want him to destroy everything. Me and Kate, we talked about that. We said, God didn't play. God said, I want you to kill the men, the old folk, the young folk, the babies, the children, the cow, the oxen, kill everything. Well, that's what God instructed him to do. And then they goes up. What do Saul? He didn't kill them, Jeff. <laughs> he, he, he didn't kill them. He, he kept the best. And he didn't even kill the king. I, I got to speed up here. <laughs> he brought the king back, I guess, to parade him and show him off and all that. Look what I did and what I did all this. And he kept the best of the animals. In chapter 15, verse 21, Samuel again is questioning him. He said, but the peoples took the spoil, the sheep and the oxen, the cheap of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice unto the Lord God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, this, is, this was Saul's excuse. He said, did you, did you do what God said? Yeah, yeah, we just tried them out. He said, why am I here all these sheep? <laughs> <laughs> he said, then he put those peoples then. He said, see, the people, mm -hmm. they, we always want to blame it on somebody else. The people took the spoil, the sheep and the oxen, the chief things, which should have been all destroyed to sacrifice to God and give gave. He, they took them. They took the bed. Well, no use in wasting all that, Jeff. They were some good animals. They took the bed. They go sacrifice to God. And Samuel said, Has the Lord great delight in burnt offering and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. So we ought to remember that. Jeff, to obey. It's better than sacrifice. We we want to sacrifice our time. We come to church and we think that's all God wants. I come to church and that's it. But to be obedient to God is better than sacrifice. I pay my tithe, but God wants you to be obedient to it. Cool. Now I'm jump down in. We about to get to the list. Saul said, "I know I messed up. I know I messed up." Chapter. 15 verse 25. Now therefore I pray thee, pardon my sins and turn again with me that I may worship the Lord. And Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. Hmm? You, are, you are rejected. And as Samuel turned to go away, he laid hold upon the skirt of his mantle. And rent it. And Samuel said unto him, The Lord has rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day, and has given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than you. Just like you rent my man, God has took the kingdom from you because of your disobedience. So I said he started out humble, but he got arrogant along the way. And God took the kingdom from him. Hmm. Oh, Saul. Now I got to go down to the last three verses, and we go right into chapter 16. We're going the last three verses. Last three verses of chapter 15. And Samuel said, As thy sword has made women's childless. So shall thy mother be childless among women. And Samuel hewed Agag in pieces before the Lord in Gilgad. I left some stuff out of there. But Saul wanted Samuel to bless him and stay with him. And Samuel said, no, I got to go. I'm going to go out and rent the kingdom for you. Please stay and, 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 and you know, 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 you know
said, no, I won't go. Then he finally told him, I'll stay for this. He said, what would you do with Agag King? And he said, go bring him here. And they went and brought him to him. And, and see the last part of that 33rd verse? Samuel hewed Agag in pieces before the Lord. This is the priest. Saul didn't do his job. So Samuel, the priest prophet, okay, Samuel took the sword, Jeff, and cut the man in pieces. 34. Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house in Gilbert of Saul, and Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord repented that he had made Saul king over Israel. First king. First king just messed up, got arrogant, and God has rejected him. Now, he had not removed him, but he has rejected him as king. And we go into verse chapter 16, verse 1. And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, saying, I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? How long? You're going to keep on. Why was Samuel mourning, A.K.? He, he, he was mourning over Saul. He, the last thing he remembered was telling Saul God and took the kingdom from him. But he's feeling bad. Jim, he's feeling bad over Saul. He, he had been with Saul for some, some years. Saul, Saul reigned for 40 years, but this is not the 40 years here. He's not the whole 40 years. But but he anybody care what nobody was mourning? Why he felt bad? Because he was a Olympic. That's part of it. Uh, well yeah. <laughs> he was instructed by God. But yeah, he, he picked him and he nurtured him and he, he trained. trained him. Yeah, he did. It, don't don't we mourn sometimes when we see people with potential? Mm -hmm. They have great potential and they just ruin their lives, Jim, whether it, whether it be with drugs or or some other means, and and, and and you know why we counsel and we've talked to them, and, and so this is what, yeah, I agree with that. And so Samuel is just more okay because of Saul. <clears throat> Ecclesiastes 3 1 to everything there's a season and a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn. There's a time for it, but then don't keep mourning. Sometimes we got to get up and we got to move on. Some people, when they lose a loved one, they just want to mourn and mourn and mourn and they go into depression, Jeff, and all this, but you got to keep living. There's a time, but then you got to get up and move on. I was in Proverbs and I put another verse in there and I said, what this got to do with the lesson? I don't know. <laughs> Proverbs 24, 17 says, Rejoice not when thine enemies fall. And let not, that not thine heart be glad when he stumbled. Please the Lord see it, and it displeases him, and he turn away his wrath from him. That's the time to mourn, and that's the time to laugh, and that's the time to rejoice. But don't rejoice when your enemy falls. See? I thought about that was some people glad when, when Saul for him. But I guess what I'm thinking about myself. And and I and I and I and Kate, I'd be praying and I'll, I'll ask God to do something with two people. <laughs> one is overseas and one is here in the United States. Yeah. Wow. And I say, well, I'd just love to see him in jail. <laughs> you know, what he said. Well, then, uh, then I look at this verse and rejoice not when you enemy fall. But but I said, well now, if he go to jail, am I gonna do a happy dance? <laughs> <laughs> He said, don't do that. Okay, because God may see you rejoicing. So, so we ought to be like Samuel. We ought to feel bad that a person with such potential messed itself up in his life and messed other people's lives up. So we ought to be praying that God could change those people rather than rejoice. You know, we, we shouldn't rejoice in the calamity of others, Jim. You just shouldn't do it. Now, yes. I rejoice to see justice done. But don't go do a happy dance. You know. Over. <laughs> oh, that, that's just me. That, that's, that's just me. I thought about it. Well, I put that in there. Six. Well, after hours, after we say, one B. Fill thy horn with oil and go. 
and I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. Samuel quit moaning. It's long enough. Get up. Feed your home of all. I got a job for you to do. Well, feed your horn. horn. They say you use it as a ram horn. You use it for making sound, but they also use it as a container. They could carry oil in these containers. <clears throat> now, I'm going to send you to Jesse, the best of my life. I have provided the king among his sons. And, and I'm thinking about all of the lessons they keep that we've been going through. We've been following the genealogy of, 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 of line, of lineage that Christ is coming through. And we got off on Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And we got off on Jacob's children. And we've been talking about some of Joseph's children, Benjamin and the tribe. And now the narrator is getting us back in line with Jesus now. And we have been all over the place looking at these peoples. And so he's bringing us back, Jeff, to the tribe of Judah in which direction his son, which is Jesus Christ, is going to come through. So when he said Jesse, ah, that's steering us back. Jesse was the grandson of Boaz and Ruth. Jesse and his family made their living as shepherds. Matthew 1 and 5 said, and Salmon begot Boaz of Rachel. Rachel. And Boaz begot Obed of Ruth. And Obed begot Jesse. And Jesse begot David the king. And David the king begot Solomon. And of her that had been the wife of Uriah. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. So in our Sunday school lesson, we have covered now, when we get up to David, 14 generations. Now, from David to they going off into Babylon, it's going to be another 14 generations. So, Jeff, when you hear them preachers preaching, and they say Christ come down through 42 generations, he said, hey, we covered the first 14. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's what we did. So, that's why that is significant. Is he, the Sunday school lessons are steering us back. To the line that Jesus will be born through. Chapter verse 2. Samuel said, How can I go? For if Saul hears, he will kill me. Now, he said, From, from where Samuel was up to Bethlehem, about 20 miles, like going from Henry to Cater. He had to make that trip. And he said, Wait a minute. So already is upset. And the last he told the last thing he said to Saul was, the kingdom been taken from you. You ain't gonna know I'm gonna be king of God. God done chose somebody else that's better than you. So now Saul ain't pleased with that. So Samuel, wait a minute, God. Oh, if Saul here, right, he's gonna kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with thee. And say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. I put a note here on Terrence for your mom. They said, me and wife, we stayed up. Well, we we still, they didn't. We talked about lying. And she said, yeah. it's okay to, for peace sake. She said, yeah, for peace sake, I, you know, tell a little lie, a little lie, for peace sake. And so the question here was, What's this a lie? Now, all the commentators I read were, what's this a lie? And then they go into the tongue. So I asked y'all, was this a lie? I mean, did God tell Samuel to lie? No. He, he didn't tell him that, did he? No. Mm -mm. no. He had to did what he told him, what he did. Oh. He, the Lord said, take a heifer with thee and say, I am come to sacrifice. This is what you tell the people. I'm come to sacrifice. So it seems you scared of Saul. Just to take a heifer and tell him this. But that's not that's not the whole reason he's going, right? No, it's not the whole reason. <laughs> <laughs> that's what he, he, he wanted to let him do. And why are you up there picked this pick boy out and pick that no. no. I agree with that. Yeah. Well, that's another point. You don't have to tell people all your business. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. That guy ain't covered now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to pick on them. I was going to I partly see, but no. <laughs> he just didn't tell me. He said, you don't have to tell the whole story. 
to tell you, and you are going to sacrifice because if you're going to anoint a king, you're going to have to do a sacrifice, you know, and all that. And, yeah, and, and this was part of his duties anyway. So he said, take a hand. With, take a female cow with He said, usually they'll, they'll sacrifice male animals. This time you just take a female. They said, well, if it's involving a peace offering or something like that, then either male or female is okay. He, he can take that. So we won't argue that case. So to answer all those, those questions about was that a lie or was that stretching the truth? No, it was the truth. He just didn't tell him all his business. And, and we all make it a habit. Sometimes you're not allowed to tell somebody, some people all your business. Because <laughs> some people will put your business out in the street. Okay? But he was following God's instruction. Verse 3. And he called Jesse to the sacrifice. Call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show thee what thou shalt do, and thou shalt anoint unto me whom I name unto thee. Take a half of going up there and call Jesse. You're going to make a sacrifice, and you call Jesse to this sacrifice. And then I'll, I'll tell you what to do. You know, when, when he called Abraham, he said, I want you to go. And just go out. And I'll tell you later. <laughs> and Abraham just got up and went. Mm. He told Samuel, just go and, and, and talk to Jesse's people. And I'm going to anoint me somebody there. I ain't going to tell you who it is. I'll tell you that. Sometimes God wants us to have a little bit of trust in him. You know, it, now, one of the step-by-step -step instruction would be great here. But God doesn't let you. I'll just go up there. And I'll tell you what to do later. <laughs> I'll tell you who. So Samuel, obedient, he got up. But see, me and Robert, we'd be saying, you want me to go up there. You want me to go to Jesse's house. What do you want me to do when I get there? You want me to anoint somebody? Who am I going to anoint? And how do you want it done? And, you know, I need to know all this. But, but now God don't give us all these step by step. Why don't we just go? Okay. Go to sir. Trust him. Verse 4 and 5, 8. And Samuel did that which the Lord spake, and came to Bethlehem, and to the elders of the town, and the elders of the town trembled at his coming, and said, Comest thou peacefully? Peaceable? And he said, Peaceable. Now, the commentary says it's, it's, it's unclear why they was trembling and why they was scared. Just because Samuel come here. Anybody care to say why? Have an idea why these guys were scared? It's the prophet coming up. The priest coming up. The judge, the last of the judge coming up. And they tremble. They said that prophets usually when they come up better than this time. They just didn't have no good news and stuff. And this prophet would kill them. Ah, that's why I put that last verses in there. <laughs> you remember Agag and that Saul didn't kill? Didn't kill in front of everybody. He didn't kill them. Samuel took the sword and cut the man up in pieces and before the people, you know. This prophet didn't play. No. He followed God's instruction to the T. And so when he came up, they said, Wait, well, hey, what, what have we done now? <laughs> you know, they trembled. Hmm. Do you come peacefully? And he said, Peacefully. They got so tired of Jeremiah coming up with all that bad news. <laughs> Jeremiah went up there talking some stuff one day and they took Jeremiah and threw him in the dungeon and he was mauled up in the mud <laughs> off in the dungeon. So prophets had a rough time doing what God tell them to do. It wasn't all roses in that line of work. Some people despise these prophets because they always come up with this bad news, Jeff. And why was they having all this bad news? Because the Israelites was always doing something bad. And God, 
God sent a prophet to talk to him. So here comes Samuel, the men is trembling. Is it peace? Verse 5, B said, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. That's what he told him. I come to sacrifice. That's what God told him. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and called them to the sacrifice. So he's going, I come to do a sacrifice. And this was part of his duty as he traveled the circuits round and round. He would sometimes offer sacrifices. We didn't have a temple at this time. So, you know, he, he, as long as the altar met God's specification, he could do a sacrifice there. But now, Saul decided he'd do one on his own, and that's against God's principle. Now, if, if Pastor Young don't show up, and he's late, and the train got him over in the cater, and it's communion Sunday, and I say, well, he's late. So I goes on up there, and I uncover communion stuff. You know? <laughs> And God ain't pleased, ain't okay, with that kind of stuff. That's what Saul had done. Okay. Okay. So he said, I'm coming to sacrifice. And, and Jesse, and I want Jesse to be a part of this meeting. Sanctify. <clears throat> when an animal was sacrificed to atone for sin, none of it was eaten. It was burnt before the Lord. The whole burnt off. You didn't get to eat any of that. But when an animal was sacrificed as a peace offering, a fellowship offering, or a consecration offering, then part of the animal was burnt before the Lord and part of it was eaten in a special ceremony. So this is what he's going up to do. It's a peace offering. All right? And so he's, he's sanctified those people. Sanctification was a ceremonial washing to remove ritual uncleanness and the donning of freshly washed clothes. The ritual of cleansing oneself for sacrifice was an acknowledgement that the ultimate, ultimately no gift can be given to God that was good enough but he would accept what came from a clean heart. So when he's going up to sacrifice you must sanctify yourself. And I got to speed up, but <clears throat> passed on first Sundays when we're going to do Holy Communion and we should sanctify ourselves. Well, how do we do it this day and time when the pastor goes over all that ritual, when he reads the prayer of consecration and all of that, in case we should participate in those prayers and that ceremony. Yeah, we should, because we are fixing to take Holy Communion. <clears throat> and this is what this is. This is just setting them aside. And that's another reason why I'm putting this in there because this is going to come back up later. <clears throat> Verse 6. And it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Yes. So he called Jesse's family. And Jesse sent his first son before Samuel. Well, I don't know where this took place. It, I don't know if they was at Jesse's house. Uh, it got back and forth on the, in the commentaries on this. But anyway, his, his, it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before me. Samuel looked at the oldest son, and he was tall, and good looking. And he said, sure, this is the one. Hey, God didn't tell him which one. God just told him to go. You know, I, I, I don't hope for <clears throat> He said, this has got to be him. Hmm. Put him out there say, This man sure looked like a king. This must be the one God would tell me to anoint. I think that's a good choice. Samuel saw a tall, good-looking young man who looked like he would be a great king and a leader. He just looked the part. Why? Mm -hmm. he, he, and, and again, he said, he didn't have on him. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> he looked like a king. Okay? He looked like a warrior. And Samuel looked at Samuel and said, ah, boy, I know this is the one. Well, don't Samuel remember 
that Saul looked the same way. Anyway, and he jumped to conclusions here. And maybe that's what we do in church. I'm going to get off this, Mayor. I'm going to get back to us in church and for long. So this, this is the prophet saying, ooh, this has got to be God's choice. Verse 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, look not on his count or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. Then don't, don't get it. So then I'll shape on the outward appearance. Yeah. Look, let me put this verse 7 there. For the Lord sees not as man sees, for man looking on the outward appearance, but the Lord looking on the heart. Right. We, are, we are making judgments by outer appearance, but God looking at the heart. In the book of Acts, the apostle said, you know, the business, chapter 6, business is it's just too great for us. We, we, we need somebody to take care of this thing of business and, and give us time for prayer and ministry. So look out among y'all and pick out seven men. Now, I'm going to stop right there. What are the criteria for those seven men? How do we pick them out? He told the congregation, look, pick out seven men. And then, hey, Kate, see you're tall one like me. That one. No. <laughs> no. What, I, I wonder if God told him that he had found a, a, a king, why they want to help him out? Well, God didn't tell him which one. So there got to be a selection process, and that's what we're going through now. And so Jesse is parading his son before Samuel. And the first one. Samuel said, that got to be him. Well, but God straightened him out. <laughs> God straightened him out. He said, see, God, what do you think? Uh, Samuel, you, you made that mistake once. So that, that's not happening this time. <laughs> he, he, he is not the one. The Lord said, I have refused him. Now, we all these commentary why I said that, that, that God is whispering on these. The Spirit, something is telling Sam. Yeah, I'll do this. And God has ways to talk to all of us. And because He talked to you one way, He may talk to me another way. But God will get the message through, and He got the message through Sam. No, that's not the one. Back to our choice in Acts 6 and 3. Wherefore, brethren, look out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, that we may appoint over the business. You know, we, we got to look. We can't just look at the appearance. How you look, yeah. yeah, how you look and make a decision. We can't just say, well, he put more money in church than others, so we'll make him. Well, gosh, no. But there's something else I want to point out. Let me put another one in there. In Titus, he was talking about uh, elder. For this cause I left thee in Crete that thou shouldst set in order the things which are wanted and ordain elders in every city as I have appointed you. If any man be, look at these, look at this criteria here. If he be blamed, the husband of one wife, he got faith for children. That means, if my children are tearing up Corbin, y'all may all put me on the board right now. I mean, because I got a little money, y'all just put me there. I mean, in these kind of positions. Uh, not accused of right, unruly. For a bishop must be blameless to steward. Now he went down from elder to bishop. All of them, all these positions mean overseer. You, you're in, you are the overseer of God's flock. Not self will not soon to anger, not given to wine, not striker, nor given to filthy lucas, but a lover of hospitality. And so all of these criteria, thank you, we should be looking at some of that stuff before we appoint somebody to position. But we look you better not be prudent and consigned, Sister Young. <laughs> we don't make you president. I don't want to make it. It don't make no difference about your character. We don't, we don't kick now. That's what, that's what it said. Hey, but let me put this in here. God told Samuel that God looketh at the heart. We can't see the heart, Claudia. So when we make our decision, we can't see the heart.
So we got to look at these character traits. Uh, we we got we got to look at the outside. We got to take all of that in consideration. Hmm. But here's another thing. It said that God knows the heart, and if God knows the heart. When we're going to select a person for an office and he he or she meets the criteria that we, some of these things that, you know, they're, they're an honest person, you know, they're a business-minded person, uh, they're not riotous. And when they meet all that, then the next thing, we need to pray. We need to talk to God because God knows the heart. Huh? We don't know the heart. We're looking at all this other stuff. But God knows the heart. He may whisper to us and say, nah, that's not the way. That's not the way. Never leave God out of the equation. All right? But don't just make your judgments based on our appearance. God right, spends a lot of time right there. <clears throat> so we ought to always pray. I know that the pastors do that in your Selected stewards, stewardesses, and all that. The pastor can't see our heart either. Some of us think we can do all this. He can't. God knows the heart. And so we ought to pray about our selection. Verse 8 and 9. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this. Then Jesse made Shema pass by. And he said, Neither has I chosen him. He just bring them in one by one. And God is, however God is getting it over to Samuel, no, it's not him. <laughs> is it? No, it's not him. Verse 10. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. All seven to pass by. Hmm. It said that, commentary note, Eliab and the seven oldest sons of Jesse were all perfect potential kings. They said, he could have chosen either one of them. They were all look. They, can't, they all look the part. They all look like they would be a, a great king. They would be perfect as far as the flesh is concerned. But keep in mind, God looketh, Jeff, at the heart. But as far as we can see, boy, that man had some, he had some bad boys. Any one of them could have been king according to us in the way we choose. But God didn't want a king after the flesh. Israel already had a king like that. That's what Saul wanted, a king after the flesh. We want a king like everybody else. So God gave him a king like everybody else. Yeah, like everybody else. One that didn't really meet the criteria. But now God is going to make the selection himself. And God is going to choose one according to his heart. And that's what we should be trying to establish. Verse 11. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the young, and behold, he keepeth sheep. Now, I told you, when, when God sent Samuel up there, he didn't tell him who the king going to be. He said, just go. Well, and I'll tell you which one. And he done went through this whole family. I'm like, Samuel getting a little nervous. He get up. They done went through this all these ways. He said, wait a minute. You have any more children? Well, any more sons? He said, well, yeah, that's one, but he keeps the sheep. This shows the low regard David had among his own family. First, his father didn't even mention his name. Second, he wasn't even invited to the sacrificial feast. And third, he was only called to come because Samuel insisted that he come. Right. David was considered an insignificant part in this affair here. Now, we don't need him. Matter of fact, he needed the baby in the family. And he, he's the youngest, and he's out there with the sheep. And, you know, there was no need to bring him here, surely. See, we're looking at the owl. Jim, he's the youngest. 
said, no, you're from bring that boy. We didn't, we didn't bring him, but yeah, guy. One more. We, we, I think we overlook some people in the church in case sometimes. And because of, they just seem to be insignificant and just won't fit in what we think they are fitting in. But God looking at the heart, and we are looking at right now, and God is looking down the road. It's another one of those qualifications I put in there. But God said, uh, God told, uh, Paul told, not, don't put a novice in a position. A novice, N-O-V-I-C-E. That means, you know, one just coming in. What am I saying? <laughs> if, if, a, if a person joined Jackson Chapel today and he's tall, dark, and handsome otherwise, uh, don't make him turn over the trustee board tomorrow. And you don't, just don't do it. That's what he's telling them. You do what you want to do. But he said, oh, you, need to, you need to observe. That's, that's how you learn their character. See if he's going to come to church, if he's going to come to the city. And, and observe how they do so you, you don't put a beginner in those positions just because we look at them and they look good. We make those mistakes in the churches. And then we overlook at somebody else that's already been there for years that will do well in that position. Somebody needs to know that. <clears throat> oh, so, yeah, I got one more something. And he said, and Samuel said to Jesse, send and fetch him. We will not sit down until he come here. So you got another son? Yeah, but he's insignificant. It don't make any difference. Go get him. Bring him here. We're not going to eat until he come. And we ain't going to partake in this meal. We're not going to do anything. Verse 12. And, and he sent and brought him in. Now he was ready and willing, a beautiful countenance, and goodly to look. Two. Hmm. He said, even though the Lord does not look on the outward appearance, the youngest was a good looking young man too. He, 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 David was good looking. He said he was ruddy. They said he either had red hair or he had red complexion skin. I don't that ruddy is. But he was the youngest. Hmm. Okay. Now, David had a pleasant appearance. Now, see, we we making the judgments now. And we don't look at all the mother boys coming through jail. And now here come David, the little fellow out there with the sheep. Okay, here he comes in. And what are we going to say about him? Uh, David had a pleasant appearance, but he didn't look like Saul. Uh, he looked, who looked like a leader, Saul did. David looked nice, but he didn't, but you don't look at him and say, there is a born leader. What is it? There is a king. That is what God people would say. In other words, he's saying that David looked okay, but he didn't look like a king. He didn't why he didn't look like kingly material. But well, he was the youngest, he was ruddy, he didn't have the muscle and the fatigue of those other boys. We're going to see that when he go out to Goliath, we're going to see that some other time. But he didn't look the part of a king, Mary, because that way we make our judgment based on looks. So, but so we don't look, we, don't, we wouldn't, we wouldn't, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have bought David in either. <laughs> okay, he didn't look the part. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Now, we, when he started this lesson out, God didn't tell him who it was. He went through a whole family head and went all the way down there. And now God finally tells him, This is he, the youngest of the tribe. This, this one God chose. It's not the one we would have chosen. If we choose according to the flesh, we would not have chosen David. Here's another part of this verse that I don't know. Why when they went and got him from following the sheep, they came, did, they, did they bring him straight in to this meeting? Uh, now these other boys were sanctified. Now I told you I spent a little bit of time to say what the sanctification was. They washed their clothes, they washed their bodies, 
and they come before, that's how they sanctified themselves. Well, they bought this boy from following the sheep. Now, did he stop home and take a bath, you know, and change clothes? Or did he come in? Oh, we know God said, this is he. I know. And can't you say he didn't stop taking a bath? No, he came on in. He came on in. Oh. God may be trying to tell us something. <laughs> Yeah, that, that, that's dealing with his color and all of that. But Frank, but God didn't pick him just then. He was already picked before he, he sent Samuel up there. He just showed Samuel who he had picked. Oh, yeah. God already knew who he was. Yeah. God already told him, go on, I want to know, want to Jesse's son. Yeah. Yeah. God knew. But Samuel didn't know. Yeah, well, I used to think like when he brought him through that. We don't, I don't pick that one. No, he had already picked him before he came up there. He had already picked Saul. Yeah. Too. God picked Saul. They went through the ceremony and cast lots and did all that. And lots fell on this family, fell on that family, then it fell on Saul. God already had picked him. Samuel had already anointed him. Yeah. Yeah. That was, you know, so, you know, you know, God just <laughs> proven himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I asked that question did he take a bath? Depending on that sanctification, that purification, and all that stuff. And, 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 and so that threw me over into Matthew 25 when he talked to the Pharisee. Jesus said unto the scribe, the Pharisee, You may clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. The blind Pharisee clean first that which is within the cup and the platter, that the outside may be clean also. So he said, God looketh at heart. We look at the outside. God looked at David's heart and David's heart was pure. And God that's why I'm saying God already knew this little boy out there with the sheep. God had been protecting him too. He done run into some stuff out there. You know, so he had faith in this God and God knew his heart. That well, all we can look at is his physique. He, he don't look like no king. You know, no. He don't look like no king. But he said Jesus told the Pharisees the same thing. Y'all good at keeping the outside clean. You, know, you look good. But, but look at the heart. Look what comes from your heart. That's what God looks at. And that's what he looks at. And like I said again, we can't see the heart. There are some criteria that a leader must meet. But then we need to pray and ask God, is this the right selection for this position? And God will let us know somehow. 13b. Samuel rose up and went to reign. He anointed this king, got up, and went on back home. Why? What did this king do? He went on back to tending his sheep. Mm -hmm. Ain't that something? And, and Pastor, I thought about this when we came okay, when we are. When we, all everything God done, He had already, well, it was already done earlier. We just falling through the steps. But God wanted Saul as king, but it was done way before the ceremony. David has been God's selection. It happened way before the ceremony. Samuel, David will not take over the kingship. It would be between ten. 15 years later before David would take over. Saul is still king. But God has already put David in place. Did for something else happen before he went back to Lamar too? The Spirit of the Lord came on him. That's a very important point. Yeah. Yeah. When he anointed him, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him from that time forth. Again, I said, the narrator is putting us in line now uh, with the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And he's pointing right on down to when Jesus was baptized in the Jordan. And the Spirit descended upon him like a dove. Mm -hmm. The same happened today when the Spirit, and it is, and then I'm out of time, but if we go on down to the next verse, <laughs> the Spirit <laughs> descended on David, the Spirit left Saul. <laughs> Oh, man. And Saul was a lunatic <laughs> from then on 
All right, any questions or comments? Because, you know, that's uh, we're out of time and the power will mess with them. So those on Facebook and all that, we apologize. But we had a little power shortage this morning. So we're a little bit over time. Any comments or questions or additions? Okay. Don't just pick Ann for a position just because she's pretty. We make a mistake like we just did. Hi, Ann. How you doing? <laughs> uh, let us pray. Lord God, teach us to value the heart over the outward appearance of a person. Purify our own hearts so that when others see us, they will see that you have chosen us and are forming us in the image of Jesus Christ. It is in Jesus' name.